Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 45, January 24th to January 30th, 1862. Before we get started, just a quick announcement. We did post a Patreon episode. This one was all for the Union, the memoir slash diary of Elisha Hunt Rhodes, who serves in the Eastern Theater throughout the war. So definitely check that out. It is posted if you are interested. And of course, the support for the show is greatly appreciated. Last week, we talked about the Battle of Mill Springs in Kentucky, which shifted the balance of the war in the West. We also mentioned the strategic situation in New Mexico fairly well, prepping us for the upcoming campaign in that theater of the war. This week, we will look at action at Fort Henry in Tennessee, beginning the campaign, gaining fame for Ulysses, and creating the nickname Unconditional Surrender Grant. Just as a scheduling note, I'm going to mess a little bit with our timeline for this particular week. I'll go over the entirety of the Fort Henry portion, even though technically it does not finish up until next week. So without further ado, let's get into the episode. I'm sure some of us listening perhaps have received an email at work and Essentially, the content of the email is, this thing is coming down the pipe, so you better either comply or we will find somebody who will. The kind of emails you say, well now, or maybe something to that effect to your computer screen. Well, in this early part of 1862, the commanders of the Union armies got just that. On January 27th, Lincoln would issue General Order No. 1. And I have it here, and I will read it in its entirety. Ordered that the 22nd day of February 1862 be the day for a general movement of the land and naval forces of the United States against the insurgent forces. That especially the army at and about Fortress Monroe, the army of the Potomac, the army of Western Virginia, the army near Munfordville, Kentucky, the army and flotilla at Cairo, and a naval force in the Gulf of Mexico be ready to move on that day. That all other forces, both land and naval, with their respective commanders, obey existing orders for the time and be ready to obey additional orders when duly given. That the heads of departments and especially the secretaries of war and of the navy with all their subordinates and the general in chief with all other commanders and subordinates of land and naval forces will severely be held to their strict and full responsibilities for prompt execution of this order. Abraham Lincoln. This order simply put was for the union forces to advance The president was tired of waiting, especially when faced with the slow-moving McClellan. McClellan, it should be said, ignored the order. This spur for offensive action would inspire Grant to move on Forts Henry and Donelson, as we will see. Lincoln would also be emboldened by his new Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, who we have introduced recently here in the last few episodes. Lincoln also spent much of his time reading up on military strategy. Here, he displays his admirable trait of wanting to educate himself on subject matter he did not fully comprehend. In our story so far, that has been the main criticism of the president. He is an amateur when it comes to war, having only served as a volunteer. West Pointers were not impressed. Certainly, even early in the war, you have Richard Anderson, who is the 
commander at Fort Sumter. He does not think highly of Lincoln. Neither does George B. McClellan, who's often writing to his wife, talking about what an idiot Lincoln is, which probably if you're going to talk smack on your boss, you you most likely don't want to have it written down. <laughs> uh, you probably want to keep that to some verbal communication uh, because then if it is, in fact, say, written in a letter, then that's saved for the rest of eternity, then obviously you don't come off looking too good. But it is telling of Lincoln that he makes strides toward closing this gap during his presidency while not becoming too involved. Lincoln is not a micromanager. He does take control of armies in the Eastern Theater for a brief period of time, you know, effectively becoming the commander-in-chief, um, but this is sort of as a result of inaction by George B. McClellan, so it seems to force Lincoln's hand. This order amazingly was given without consultation with military or cabinet, though, which displays Lincoln's understanding that as commander-in-chief, as mentioned, he will need to become more involved. Lincoln is a yes to hands on. My points are this. As we continue our narrative, I know I probably don't need to point out Lincoln should be included as one of the greatest presidents of all time. But I really want to illustrate these points because we should know the why and not simply take his inclusion as a given just because, say, he has a very large monument in Washington, he's on the $5 bill, He's on the penny. Those shouldn't be reasons why we're saying he's obviously one of the greatest presidents. It goes a lot deeper than that. As mentioned, there would be those spurred to action by the call for a general advance, which came from the president. If you recall, Don Carlos Buell had been given the task to take Nashville. He was moving slowly toward that goal, although to be fair to him, at least he was moving as opposed to the overall army commander in the East. Henry Halleck, who, if you remember, was over the department in Missouri, would move Ulysses Grant in an effort to take pressure off of Buell and hopefully divert Confederate resources toward a potential thrust into Tennessee. We very briefly introduced Fort Henry and Fort Donelson. These two southern works were key to protecting the Tennessee and Cumberland rivers, respectively. They would also be a good location to stage a potential further invasion of Kentucky, as troops and supplies could be transported via the waterways. Albert Sidney Johnson would understand that to get at Tennessee, there would be only a handful of possible routes. The Mississippi River was protected by Columbus. Forts Henry and Donaldson checked any advance along the Tennessee and Cumberland. Simon Bolivar Buckner was able to protect any advance along the Louisville and Nashville Railway at Bowling Green. Zollicoffer and Crittenden had attempted to bolster this right flank, but had been defeated at Mill Springs. Maintaining the current position would be critical. Let's talk about Fort Henry and explain the unfortunate nature of its location. Now, these forts were constructed because they could potentially provide support and resupply to one another. I'll try to throw up a map on the website so as to illustrate this. Donaldson was actually placed on higher ground, so it was a better defensive position. Henry was placed on lower swampy ground. The reason it was on lower ground was that it was placed on a site of a steamboat landing, so it needed to be close to water. <laughs> 
Now, the problem with being close to water, while it is advantageous to, say, a steamboat that is able to pull up fairly close to land, right? The problem, if you have a fort there, is that you are close to water. And if the water level rises, then that could be a potential issue. Despite this setback, it did have a clear field of fire. The purpose, though, we should point out, was to defend the river, so infantry assault was not on the mind of those constructing. The engineer over this project was one Bushrod Johnson. Now, the construction of a fort placed in a less than optimal spot is not probably the best time to introduce Bushrod Johnson, but we are going to go ahead and do it anyway. Bushrod was actually born in Belmont, Ohio in 1817. He would attend West Point and see action in the war with Mexico and against the Seminoles. He actually resigned and served as an officer of militia in both Kentucky and Tennessee prior to the outbreak of hostilities. He would first become a colonel of engineers before being promoted to Brigadier General. After Donaldson, he would escape capture by the Union forces. I looked up exactly how he did this, and we'll talk about it here when we get into Fort Donaldson, but he apparently just walked away, which I sort of think is anticlimactic, but I'm sure it was maybe a daring brisk walk. He will see action at Shiloh and Chickamauga before finishing out the war in the Eastern Theater. Fort Henry was armed with some 17 guns in early 1862, but the Tennessee River was running high. Parts of the fort were often flooded as a result. There was a fortified camp on the Kentucky side of the river to provide support but lack of available guns above water was an issue. There were also torpedoes deployed in the river, which are 1860s versions of sea mines. Between the two locations along the Tennessee River were around 3,000 Confederates. Commanding both Henry and Donaldson was General Lloyd Tillman. Tillman was a Maryland native who attended West Point before becoming a construction engineer for railroads. He will serve briefly on the staff of Twiggs during the Mexican-American War. After Fort Donelson, he will be exchanged and go on to continue to serve in the Confederate Army before being hit in the chest by a shell fragment in 1863. Tillman would lament the poor placement of Fort Henry even after the capitulation of the two forts. He be quoted that Fort Henry was a wretched military position. The history of military engineering records no parallel to this case. The infantry under Tillman would actually be placed under the command of Adolphus Hyman. Hyman would be the namesake of the fort across the river. I feel like we have already briefly mentioned Hyman, the Prussian immigrant who had become an architect in Tennessee prior to the war. During the Mexican-American War, he had served in the 1st Tennessee Regiment of Volunteers. He will fall ill after being taken prisoner and die in late 1862. In early 1862, it was partially on Hyman for not building up the defenses across the river which is going to play a pretty big part in Ulysses S. Grant and his capture of Fort Henry. Speaking of Grant, one of the things that he is praised for is his coordination with the Navy. The river fleet would be key to his campaigns in the West. In early 1862, he will have a good one in Andrew Hull Foot who was born in New Haven, Connecticut in 1806. Foote actually attends West Point briefly 
before joining the Navy. His journeys took him all over the world. In 1856, while observing the British Navy during the Opium War in China, Foote will jump in and participate. He will lead a landing party after being fired upon, so very much a man of action. At the outbreak of the war, he'll be sent to take control of the river flotillas for the U.S. Navy. The rear admiral would make sure to build a good rapport with Henry Halleck, as well as Ulysses S. Grant. Foote is actually able to convince Henry Halleck that this plan that Ulysses S. Grant hatches is worthwhile and should be executed. He will have several vessels, including a number of ironclads. As far as infantry goes, Grant will have approximately 15,000 men. One division is under the command of McClernand, whom we have introduced previously. Another division is under the command of C.F. Smith. Charles Ferguson Smith had been a career soldier prior to the Civil War. The Philadelphia native served as superintendent at the Military Academy and even instructed Ulysses Grant as well as Sherman. Reportedly, the two younger men felt awkward about giving Smith orders, which is understandable. Smith also served well during the war with Mexico and participated in the Mormon expedition. C.F. Smith does come to an unfortunate end, dying of an infection aggravated by dysentery. Smith is definitely a what-if of the war. Some believing Shiloh may have turned out different had he been there. In fact, due to a miscommunication, he was actually slated to command the forces under Grant, so it very well could have turned out very differently. Also forming what would eventually become the Army of Tennessee would be another division under Lew Wallace. Wallace was a native of Indiana and is probably better known as the author of Ben-Hur. A lawyer and politician as well as volunteer during the Mexican-American War, Wallace would perform well during the war, responsible for the successful delaying action at Monocacy. Wallace would also preside over the court-martial of Henry Wirtz, who was mentioned as the Commandant of Andersonville. After the war, Lou will become the territorial governor of New Mexico and ambassador to Turkey. I also want to very briefly mention the Corps of Engineers was under one James McPherson, but we'll get into a better introduction for McPherson here in a later episode. Grant's plan was fairly simple, and it was his plan that was proposed to Henry Halleck. Halleck would at first dismiss Grant. Let's remember that Grant already had one aggressive move under his belt at Belmont that very well could have wound up being a disaster. Halleck would not have soon forgotten. Additionally, there was still a reputation that Grant was a drinker, therefore his plan could have simply been thought up in a drunken stupor. Although it should be noted that Henry Halleck is the one who's spreading those rumors mostly, so there is that. Grant was not the alcoholic his critics claimed, and fortunately Rear Admiral Foote signed off on the plan, as we already mentioned. There was a rumor going throughout the ranks that Confederate General PGT Beauregard the hero of Sumter and Manassas, was on his way to the Western Theater. With him would be coming multiple regiments. This would add to the sense of urgency felt by the Union generals, especially in the face of the general order to advance by Washington's birthday in February. Supported by the Navy, Grant would land McClernand north of Fort Henry, while C.F. Smith would take Fort Hyman on the Kentucky side of the river. Confederate forces were poorly armed with antiquated flintlocks, so the potential assaults had a great possibility of success. There had been much focus on the creation of the Brownwater Navy on the part of the Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells. In 
supporting Grant will be four ironclads of the City Class series, the USS Essex, USS Cincinnati, USS Carondelet, and USS St. Louis, as well as three timber-clad vessels, Conestoga, Tyler, and Lexington. Manning the Western Flotilla was a hodgepodge of men, many volunteers from the Army. These individuals were often lured by promises of no more drill or digging, so probably not always the cream of the crop, as you could imagine. Every hiring manager wants to hear that you do not want to do any hard work, am I right? Foote's western flotilla would glide down the river and begin to open fire on the fort on February 6th. The infantry was delayed due to the muddy roads. Ironically, considering the swelling river probably made travel a little easier while also taking away firepower from the Confederates. The torpedoes were washed away, so they were unable to impede the approach by water. At 1,700 yards, the ironclads would fire on the fortification. Their bow weaponry was able to bring to bear 18 guns on Fort Henry. Any return fire would connect directly with the metal plating of the vessels doing very little damage. This was not to say, though, that the Confederate fire was ineffectual. The smokestack of one vessel was actually severely damaged, knocking the ironclad out. The USS Cincinnati, the flagship of the operation, reportedly took at least 32 direct hits from the Confederate defenders. Despite the accurate return fire, Tillman would read the writing on the wall. All but four of the rebel guns were taken out by the pounding of Foote's fleet. He knew that Fort Henry was not going to be defensible for too much longer. His remaining artillery would return fire long enough for much of the garrison to escape in the direction of Fort Donelson. Remember, the forts are within a distance they can support each other, so it's not a terribly long march to get there. And the infantry portion of Grant's army had not gotten into position, so they were not there to block any kind of retreat. When Foote advanced his ships closer so as to continue to pound the fort into submission, the Confederate commander would order the white flag raised. Illustrating the high level of the water, it was necessary to row through the fort to actually accept the surrender. This added into taking away from the Confederate ability to defend the fort as well. Tillman, along with a few hundred Confederate defenders, would capitulate to the Navy rather than the rapidly advancing forces under Grant. Said forces would arrive shortly thereafter, occupying Fort Hyman and Henry without incident. Casualties were on the lighter side. Both would suffer around 30 during the 75-minute bombardment. Grant, though, would not be satisfied with just Fort Henry. It will soon be Fort Donaldson's turn to come to blows with the Rising Star. As a side note, the opening of the Tennessee River would lead to the three timberclad vessels already mentioned moving down the river until it became unpassable, raiding as they went. As a result, the Navy was able to knock out a key railroad bridge if you were to go to Fort Henry today, I think it is interesting to note that you would not be able to see much. And the reason you wouldn't be able to see much is because Fort Henry is currently underwater, which I think goes even further to illustrating the poor nature of the placement of the fort, as Tillman mentioned in his writings. On January 30th, 1862, the USS Monitor was launched from Gree Point, Long Island. Erickson's creation would defy the critics and actually float. If you remember, there had been doubts about whether the ship would sink to the bottom immediately taking all hands the minute it was shoved out into open water. 
the USS Monitor contained six-inch thick armor. The turret was nine feet high, 22 feet in diameter, and could rotate 360 degrees. The twin Dahlgren guns were ready to do damage against the Confederate States. The CSS Virginia would not be launched until February, and they will not come face to face until March, but we are that much closer to the showdown between the two famous naval vessels. I think we can pause there, having had a fairly busy week. General Order No. 1 had been dropped by Abraham Lincoln, hoping to get the Union armies into motion. Grant has successfully captured the key position of Fort Henry, and the USS Monitor has launched in New York. Next week, we have a little bit of a lighter week, event-wise, so I think I'm going to go in a different direction by rounding off some of the key pre-war military experience by the officers so far in our story, as well as go on a tangent about elephants. So you probably don't want to miss that. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, Patreon, as well as Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show would be greatly appreciated. Once again, feedback is welcome. Questions, comments, concerns. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening, and have a great week.